Grace, mercy, and peace be yours tonight from God our and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. From Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So far the text this evening. The Jerusalem temple, beautiful, overlaid with so much gold, it was dazzling, almost blinding in the sunlight. The roof of the temple glistened in the sun and shone across the mountain tops as the pilgrims came to the city of, of God. Herod the Great is the builder of that temple, and surrounding that temple, he put an amazing court, a huge court, the greatest court in the ancient world that surrounded a temple complex. To do that, he had to build massive retaining walls and to flatten and fill in the top of Mount Moriah in order to accommodate it. And that temple was being built in the ancient world even as Joseph and Mary made their way to the city of Bethlehem, traveling south from Nazareth, past the temple complex itself, on the way to the little community. Brought there to the temple after the birth of Jesus, the Savior for her purification and for his dedication. It was still some 30 years later being built as Jesus arrived in Jerusalem on that marvelous Palm Sunday. As he taught in the streets and as he taught in the temple complex, as he came with his disciples to worship in those three uh, festivals that were required every year of all adult males, Jesus saw the temple going up. Week after week, month after month, Herod's temple long outlasted him as it was being built. Unlike the other gospel writers, Luke, is pay, Luke pays special attention in his gospel to the temple of God. Because this temple being built by Herod, which was celebrated by Israel, was a hallowed dwelling of God. And to the Gentiles, it was also a remarkable size and a majestic building. Jesus and his followers gathered there for the rites and the festivals, the teachings that marked Jesus' progress through this world. There from the cradle to Good Friday where he would be crucified outside the city walls. And after the resurrection, Jesus' disciples would gather in that temple complex to worship God and to teach and to talk. Luke's focus on the temple as a context for Jesus' life and for his ministry includes his birth and his boyhood. It includes his growing up, his temptation, his preparation for ministry, his passion, and his exaltation all around the temple of God. God's mighty deeds promised by Abraham and his descendants are fulfilled in the coming of that Christ. And by his incarnation and his death, Jesus puts fallen creation back into the realm of what is truly magnificent, the handiwork of God. His life is God's great reversal, you see. For the lowly are uplifted and the great are brought down. Luke, the beloved physician, was Paul's companion on his missionary journeys, his faithful friend, even in his imprisonments. He joined Paul on the second missionary journey, and his ministry went along with Paul, beginning in Acts chapter 16, accompanying him finally to the city of Philippi, where Paul left him off there to help build the church for seven years. And then in the year 55 AD, when Paul came through Philippi on his way to Jerusalem with an offering, he picked up Luke and took him with him. It would be Paul's last trip to Jerusalem because, as you know, it was there in the city that Paul would be arrested. 
sent to Caesarea, and finally on to Rome. And there Luke accompanied him in Rome throughout his imprisonment. The theme in the beginning of the gospel that we look at in the gospel of Luke is fulfillment. Because Luke gives to us the fulfillment of the promises of God brought to fruition in Jesus the Christ, who is born three miles outside in the city of David in Bethlehem. And as he looks at the Lord in the beginning of his gospel, he looks in great detail with only the eye of a physician, with the eye toward detail. And he gives us in great detail one of the greatest gifts that we have in the church. This gospel that talks about the very beginnings of our Savior. The Annunciation to Zechariah and Elizabeth of the forerunner of the Christ. The Annunciation. And as he looks through the ministry of Jesus to his fulfillment at Calvary. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of these things that have been fulfilled among us, he writes. It's Luke who in detail introduces us first to the angel Gabriel, who appeared to Zechariah standing at the right side of the altar of incense in the temple. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Words addressed first to a chief priest in Israel named Zechariah of the household and lineage of Abijah. His wife, a descendant of the high priest Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Elderly as Abraham and Sarah, and yet notice how carefully Luke identifies them. And not only their names, but their backgrounds, the participants in the story of the Christ. The participants, the places, and the things that occur. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Most of what Mary has to say is record, recorded for us by St. Luke. It's St. Luke who tells of the two mothers, Elizabeth and Mary, being brought together by God. And from the visit comes the first of four wonderful songs from the Bible that we use in our liturgy that are standard to what we do and how we worship God. And of course, the first canticle or short hymn or song is Mary's Magnificat. She says to Elizabeth, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And the second canticle or little hymn that we sing is called the Benedictus. The Benedictus is a hymn of blessing God. Not blessing from God, but us blessing God. And here we see uttered by Zechariah with his newfound voice after the birth of John in the fulfillment of the prophecy of Gabriel, the announcement of the angel, a song of prophecy. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Then, of course, we speak, uh, peek into chapter 2, and there we find the glory in Excelsis Deo, familiar Christmas hymn that we sing, and one that appears again in our liturgies, the angelic hymns sang by the heavenly hosts in the skies over Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. 
And finally, the song of old Simeon in the temple, which we call the Nunc Dimittis, when he was able to see the newborn Christ child as God promised that he would before he died. He said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So with all that attention to detail, Luke's emphasis seems to assure us that he is talking about real people in real places in real time. It's not a once upon a time in a kingdom far, far away story, but involves Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and shepherds and Simeon and Anna. And they live in a real historic place in real historic circumstances. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register. Even Anna's ancestry is documented by Luke in the finest of details. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. And if you want to hear a meticulous historic historian at work, remember how Mark simply presented the appearance of John the baptizer on the scene by saying immediately. Listen to Luke's detailed description of John's appearance. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. During the time of the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Real people, real events. Matthew traced the ancestry of Jesus in his gospel back to Abraham, as we heard last week. And Luke starts about the same point. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, as it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Madhat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, but he doesn't stop just with David. He goes back farther. Halfway down the church aisle on our timeline is where we said David was. And the doorway to our sanctuary, Abraham's, Abraham's time. But he carries it through those doors, out through the narthex, out the front doors and into the parking lot. Because he goes on ultimately saying the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Malthusalah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Luke is a man under God, determined to give us the details in an orderly way of how the priests even burn the incense in the temple and determining the location of what is happening within the temple courts as the events unfold around Zechariah. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Four lots were drawn when the priest took their turn to serve in the temple, and uh, Zechariah had the third lot, the third lot during the afternoon, early evening, to burn the incense. Luke provides us even the gist of the angel's message when he speaks to Mary. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. 
His kingdom will never end. Joseph's itinerary is provided. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. Down to the delightful little details that we've come to know and love in the Christmas story. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Yes, Luke is taking pains to present an orderly account of all that the eyewitnesses and the servants of the word have seen and described, that we might know with absolute certainty the things that did take place. He wants Theophilus and all of us to know that what we have learned about Jesus is absolutely true. And we also find here that it is real. A real Savior in real history, in a real situation, a real Redeemer. Born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. <laughs>